Okay, welcome back to the final part of this lecture on the properties of the sun. Uh, as you can see, I've got my solar uh, backdrop picture again. I forgot it in the last lecture, so I'll keep having topical backgrounds, hopefully. Um, so again, I uh, we'll left you with a question to think about. Um, so that was what stops the sun collapsing under its own weight. So various options here. Um, so the first one was uh, strong nuclear repulsion between uh, uh, the atoms in the sun, or perhaps more strictly the, uh, the nuclei in the center. Uh, now, of course, you know, protons are positively charged and uh, protons will uh, repel each other because they have are both positively charged and and that's part of the problem for how to get nuclear fusion working in the first place um, and it's why nuclear fusion is so difficult to recreate here on the earth because you need to recreate those extreme conditions uh, on the sun um, but but that electrostatic repulsion only comes in you know when the uh, protons are extremely close to each other uh, and is not relevant for the normal spacing uh, between uh, the uh, nuclei in, in the sun. And so it's it's not responsible for uh, any significant uh, outward pressure to uh, keep the sun up against the inward pull of gravity. So next option was the outward flow of neutrinos. Uh, so I did say that, you know, there are lots and lots of neutrinos flowing out through the sun, uh, but I also mentioned they are very weakly interacting fundamental particles, uh, which means that even though there's uh, a huge flux of them uh, going out through the sun. Um, in conditions like the sun, they do not uh, exert any significant uh, outward pressure. There are conditions in astrophysics where a flow of neutrinos may well exert a significant pressure, uh, for instance, in a supernova explosion that we'll encounter later in the module, but not, not in normal stars like the sun. The next option uh, is the pressure of radiation uh, flowing out through the star. So obviously you've got a lot of photons uh, hurtling out through the, uh, the sun and they will interact with matter as they get absorbed. And of course, uh, we will see this later in the module, uh, photons do exert a pressure because again, energy and mass are equivalent. So even though the photon is a, uh, has a zero rest mass particle, does have energy and those, therefore it does have momentum. Um, and so radiation can exert a pressure when it's flowing in a particular direction. But in the interior of a star, um, like the sun, uh, it's not significant, uh, not, in the, not usually. Okay, so uh, we will, again, will come across instances where uh, the pressure of radiation is significant in astrophysics. The outer layers of extremely luminous stars, it can be significant, but in the interiors of most normal stars, it's, it's not significant. Now I do come across an awful lot of students who think that stars are held up by radiation pressure, but it's, it's not true. So the correct uh, choice uh, was D. So the uh, the reason the sun doesn't collapse under its own gravity uh, is purely because of the uh, just the normal uh, thermal gas pressure of the extremely high temperature gas uh, that is uh, within the sun. So I mentioned previously, you know, the temperature in the center is uh, is very high, 10 million Kelvin. Uh, also, the density is extremely high. So both of those will go to giving extremely high pressure, and it's that drop off in pressure, the gradient in pressure, as you go out through the sun from the very hot, dense center to the cooler, less dense outer regions that gives you a pressure gradient. And that pressure gradient exactly counteracts the inward pull of gravity uh, at all points in the star. And so that's what keeps the star, the sun stable. Um, and so that's the correct answer. Uh, e, the, the idea that might be a solid in the middle, uh, that's, that's not true. So as I mentioned before, the sun is a, is a gas, basically the ideal gas law, the one you learned at school, um, applies throughout the entire uh, sun. There's nothing unusual anywhere in the sun, just normal thermal gas pressure is all you need. So that was that one. Okay, so I also asked you to go and uh, check the uh, 
idea that this, uh, there's a mass difference between four protons and one helium-4 nucleus. So if you go and look up the uh, atomic weights of, of each of these atoms or nuclei, it doesn't really matter which you do, um, this is the mass of one uh, helium nucleus, sorry, hydrogen nucleus. And so if you do four times that and subtract off the mass of one helium nucleus here, you can see that there is indeed a difference. And that is your 0 0.0286 atomic mass units that I mentioned in the lecture. Uh, and if you turn that into a percentage, just divide by the, uh, the mass of uh, four hydrogens here, and that gives you the 0 0.007. Or 0.7% that we discussed earlier. So hopefully you can uh, see for yourself that this is where it's really this is where the energy is coming from, from this mass difference here. Okay, so let's now move on to ask what happens to that energy that was generated in the thermonuclear core here. Uh, what happens? You know, I said that basically, basically high energy gamma rays are coming out here, high energy photons in the center. Um, which is basically heating the gas up here to the, the 10 million Kelvin. Um, how does that energy get transformed to the surface, transported to the surface, and, um, and therefore resulting in uh, the sort of visible surface of the sun that we see shining today? So how is the energy transported? So there, I'm sure you've learned previously in physics that there are basically Three ways in which you can uh, transport uh, heat energy, okay. and heat's what we're really talking about here. So you can have uh, conduction, convection, or radiation. Okay. So those are the three methods of heat transport. Now conduction is not going to work because as we've just discussed, there is conduction only really works for solids, um, and there is no solid material anywhere in the sun. It's a, it's a gas everywhere. So we can rule out conduction. So that leaves uh, radiation and convection. Uh, and in fact, both of them operate in the sun, uh, but at different points. So uh, over the first, as soon as the uh, energy starts to leave the core, it is firstly transported by radiation. So basically photons working their way out. Uh, but of course they are interacting with matter as they go. So it does actually take them quite a long time to to work their way out, but they are slowly, photons are basically slowly working their way out. Um, and so that transfers the energy by the radiation. But when you get to the uh, outer third of the sun, then convection takes over. Um, so that is a, a total change. And so here you've got this uh, constant convective motion uh, with convection currents uh, in the outer third. So how do we know that? Well, it leads to an observable phenomenon. Okay. So the whole idea of uh, convection uh, is to do with basically the buoyancy of sort of hot bubbles of gas. Okay. So hot gas, uh, if it's hotter than its surroundings, will have a uh, slightly lower density and therefore uh, buoyancy forces means that it starts to rise. And so you get these hot bubbles of gas, eventually turning into a whole hot column of gas that rises up towards the surface of the sun. When it gets to the surface, it's suddenly exposed to the sort of cold outer regions of space, and then it can quickly radiate that energy away and cool down. And so then you've got uh, a region of cool gas, which is more dense than its surroundings, uh, and so it falls back down again. And so this is the idea of convection. You, know, you can see convection every day. Hopefully some of you are you know, learning how to boil an egg or pasta for the first time. Uh, you, know, you put your um, boiling, uh, put your pan of water on the, on the stove. If you turn the heat up really high, uh, you'll soon start to see this uh, bubbling motion uh, in the water. So that, that is exactly convection. So it's heat being transferred from the bottom of the pan to the top uh, by convection. You can also see it in, in gases on a very hot day. If you look along a sort of a hot road uh, into the distance, you can see columns of air uh, bubbling around, which usually sort of distorts the, uh, the vision in, in, along that line of sight. 
So that's the idea of convection. So that's what's going on in the, in the sun. And um, that leads to a particular sort of pattern or appearance on the surface of the sun, uh, which is referred to as granulation. Okay. So you can see that quite well on the diagram here. So you can see that this is the, these arrows indicate where the convective motion is going. So the hot columns are rising. So the, the middle of a hot column of rising gas will be slightly hotter than its surroundings. And as you can imagine, uh, a slightly hotter gas actually has, emits more radiation than a slightly cooler gas. And so the, the regions at the top of the convection cells, when you look at them in optical light, are brighter than the surroundings. And the surroundings are where the cool gas is beginning to fall back down into the sun again. So it's cooled off and it's now turning over and falling back down again. And so that gives you uh, a, slight, a sort of a darker surrounding sort of to this uh, grain that appears brighter. So it really looks, you know, like, like grains, also looks quite similar to the sort of pores on your skin you know, if you do a real close up look at the surface of the sun. And uh, we can actually see this in action. So this is, you know, this is dynamic, right? So this is actually bubbling away all the time on the surface of the sun. So if you take very special telescopes that are designed to look at the sun, of course, again, please never look at the sun with any optical instrument, because uh, you'll blind yourself. Um, but special solar telescopes, quite big ones actually, are built to look at really high resolution um, parts of the surface of the sun. And here you can see a, a, an image. So this would be really zooming in to the surface of the sun. Uh, and you can see this granular appearance here. This is real data from the uh, uh, Swedish Solar Telescope. And so you can see what we mean by the granular appearance. Okay. So here is a particular uh, top of a convection cell. So you can see it's brighter because it's slightly hotter than its surroundings and it's surrounded by this slightly darker region. Obviously the contrast is really enhanced here to see this. And, um, and, and that's what you see. So you see this everywhere on the sun. But this is not just a picture, it's a movie. So if we play the movie, then you can see this bubbling uh, surface of the sun. So it's a bit like, uh, almost looks a bit like sort of jam in the making, so sort of, sort of quite viscous. But of course, what we're looking at here is, is gas. Okay. So these are just gas cells uh, and the tops of them are just uh, moving around a little bit uh, as the convection goes away, it goes underneath. Okay. So, so you've got good evidence for the motion here in these, in these movies. Um, another way of looking at it, of course, and something we'll come back to time and time again in this course, is that you can prove that the, uh, the tops of these convection cells are uh, coming towards us by using the Doppler shift. So the Doppler shift is something we will use many times. Uh, if you look at a spectral line rather than just the, the bright image here, if you use a spectrograph to pick out a particular uh, spectral line, if the gas is coming towards us, it'll be shifted to the blue. If the gas is going away from us, it'll be shifted to the red end of the spectrum. And we can see that on this next plot. Okay. So this plot is colored. It, again, it's a very, so very similar close up to the surface of the sun that we saw previously, but this time, it's been color coded to show uh, the velocities. Blue velocities here show um, gas coming towards us. And the red uh, regions are uh, regions where gas is moving away from us. So again, you can see these tops of convection zones in blue. So that's the gas coming towards us. And regions surrounding them uh, in red, where the gas is sinking back down again. And there's a scale on here, okay? And uh, I'll come back and ask you to have another look at this diagram uh, for an exercise at the end of this part. Okay, so we've worked our way to the surface here. Um, so that's the bit we wanna talk about next. Uh, what do we mean by the surface of the sun? You, know, you can see in the picture of my background here that it, it looks like there's a very sharp uh, edge to the sun, but um, you know, it's kind of misleading. Okay. So the photosphere 
is what we normally use as the official term for the visible surface of the sun. Um, so photo referring to, to photons and things we can see with our eye. Um, but there is, you know, as I've said before, there's no solid surface. It's not like landing on a planet where you suddenly go clonk uh, and you've landed, you know, you've gone from air, from a gas to a solid or gas to a liquid. There's no such change in density. Okay. So everything in the sun is just gas, right? Mm. And so basically, the, as you go in towards uh, the solar surface, if you dropped a probe into the sun, you would not see any sudden change in density or temperature. The density and temperature would just steadily increase as you drop down through the height of the uh, atmosphere or, or the photosphere. Now, throughout this course, of course, we will talk about the surface temperature of the sun or the surface temperature of the star. So um, we will discuss this a bit more in upcoming lectures, but basically there's, a, there's an effective temperature of the sun um, for the surface. So that, you know, that visible yellow surface that we can see, a few sort of various ways of measuring the temperature of that surface, it comes out at just below 6,000 Kelvin. So 5,800 to be precise. Okay. So there are, there are various ways of, of measuring the uh, sort of surface temperatures, but for the sun, you, you can do it in several different ways, and this is the answer you get. So effectively, this is really the, you know, you can only see so far into the, into the sun's atmosphere before it becomes opaque. So that's a good working definition of, of what the visible surface is. You can see so far in, and then it, then you can't see any further. Okay. So that's quite similar to you know looking through dense fog. You know you, you'd say in a very in a situation where you had a very dense fog in the evenings. You know you've got a visibility of 50 meters or something. You can see 50 meters ahead of you into the fog, but no further. So that kind of gives a surface as well. So it's that kind of idea. Okay, this diagram here that I've doctored a little bit for reasons you'll see in a moment um, is just to, again, you don't need to worry about the details here, but it's basically a graph um, of how the temperature is dropping as you go up through the height of the atmosphere of the sun. So here we've got height above the limb in thousands of kilometers. Okay, so this visible edge, if you like, to the, to the surface of the sun, is marked by the vertical dash line here and the photosphere is this region you know exactly around that point or just above that well, just at, at that visible edge basically okay. but you can see the temperature just keeps dropping steadily here there's no jump or anything at this point and up here um, we've got um, effectively the density of the gas here i've marked it with rho which is really mass density although actually what is plotted here is is n the number density rather than the mass density, but basically it's, the, it's showing you the same thing. So the density of, of the gas here also, you know, there's no jump here, it's just steadily dropping, okay? And so the photosphere does not mark any, any jump in temperature or density. It really is to do with how uh, opaque it is to uh, optical radiation. So that defines the visible edge of the surface. Okay, so that's the photosphere and it's in that, photospheric layer, that's where you see the granulation, that's what those pictures were that I, that I just showed you. And that's what we see every day when you see that glowing yellow sphere in the sky. Okay. What you're seeing there is the photosphere. But as we shall now move on to, uh, something quite dramatic happens, especially to the temperature, as you go further up in the atmosphere. Again, we don't need the details here uh, in this module. Um, Feel free to read around it a little bit if you want, but it's, we don't need the details. All I'll point out here is that as you go up, way up into the atmosphere of the sun, and something really dramatic happens to the temperature. Instead of being down here at 6,000 Kelvin at the visible uh, surface of the photosphere, um, a little way up, it suddenly jumps up to, you can see the scale here, up to a million Kelvin. Okay. So suddenly you've got extraordinarily hot gas that sits above the visible surface of the sun and extends out to a very long way, as you can see here. Okay. 
tens of thousands of kilometers actually. Um, but it's very low density, okay? So you can see the density drops dramatically here. This is a logarithmic scale. So it's dropped by 10, or 10 orders of magnitude, a factor of 10 billion lower in density, but a factor of 100 higher in temperature. So what's going on here? You can see it labeled as the corona. So that's where we're going next. So this is, the corona is really the sort of outer atmosphere of the sun, way above the visible surface that we see as the photosphere. And as I've just said, it's very hot, a million degree, a million Kelvin, and very tenuous, meaning very low density. So low density, very hot gas. How do we know it's there? Well, um, one way that it was, its existence has been known for a long time is through this uh, very strange natural phenomena, actually, which is the total solar eclipse of the sun by the moon. Okay. So I'll show you some pictures in a second. Um, so during an, during an eclipse, you, the moon exactly blocks out the visible photosphere. And so uh, when you do that, um, only then can you see any evidence that there is this very extended um, hot uh, solar atmosphere called the corona. And you see it as basically a white halo uh, surrounding the sun out to quite large distances uh, during the eclipse. So several solar radii it extends to, so several, several times the radius of the sun. So that's one way to see it. You can see that, you know, literally with your naked eye uh, during a total solar eclipse here on the Earth. Okay. But, you know, in these days it's studied in great detail uh, using satellites that observe at uh, much shorter wavelengths or higher energies. As you might imagine, something that's very hot like this emits most of its radiation at, uh, at high energies because the gas itself is very hot. So the extreme ultraviolet and the X-ray region are extremely good uh, wave bands for studying the, this very, very hot gas. And I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. So here on this next slide, you can see a sort of a, a photo montage, like you know, a time sequence of what happens during a total solar eclipse. Obviously the moon starts to creep across the surface uh, of the disk of the sun. And as it gets totally covered, so this is the totality here, the moon totally covers the uh, photosphere of the sun. And that then suddenly reveals, because the sky goes dark effectively, you can suddenly see this much fainter white uh, halo of emission. And this is the corona and you can see it here, it's extending out quite significant distances uh, up from the uh, visible photosphere of the sun. And this is a sort of a, an enhanced image of a total solar eclipse to really bring out the uh, this white glowing uh, light from the halo uh, of the corona. And here you can start to get some clues as to perhaps what's going on with the corona. Hopefully you can see this, the kind of striations and structure here uh, in the emission. So it looks like, it mostly looks like a bit like a bar magnet picture. You've got a, a magnetic axis here, okay? So there's clearly some kind of axis here. And just like iron filings following uh, the magnetic field in a bar magnet, you get the impression that there's a, there's a sort of a magnetic field going on here. Uh, for the sun, which indeed there is, which will be the subject of the, the next lecture, really. Okay, and and the this uh, hot gas in the corona, which is a plasma, it's ionized, of course, is affected by the magnetic field. It's shaped and structured by it. Um, and so here again, you can now see that the emission from the coronal gas extends many, many solar radii, several diameters away. We will come back to that more in the next lecture. And here, um, here's our first perhaps uh, full on multi wavelength picture. This is an x ray picture of the sun. So it looks totally different. Okay? So, you know, you get the impression that the, the disk of the sun is in here, but large parts of the, the disk of the sun here are, are not emitting x rays at all. Okay? So the photosphere would not emit any x rays whatsoever because it's only down at 6,000 Kelvin. So what you're seeing now is extended emission, uh, you know, high up in the atmosphere from this hot million degree gas. 
So you've got uh, basically this gas is emitting because you've got um, hot electrons moving around, encountering uh, protons now and again, and they get bent around. So this is a, a, an emission mechanism called Bremsstrahlung, which we will meet later in the module as well. But that's basically what you're seeing here: it's hot electrons emitting uh, as they move fast around in this uh, million degree gas. But again, you're starting to see huge amounts of structure here. So you've got these holes where there's nothing going on. So there's no corona here. That's called a coronal hole. You can see these loops, which we'll come to more in the next uh, lecture. See them off the edge here. It's very three-dimensional, very structured. But the, the main takeaway message from this lecture is that you've got this extended hot corona uh, around the edge of the sun. And we will sort of explain where it's coming from in the next lecture. So just to summarize the whole of this uh, first one on the properties of the sun, uh, the sun is a very average star, as we shall see throughout this module, halfway through its 10 billion year lifetime. The energy, as we've seen, is nicely explained by the nuclear fusion of hydrogen into helium in the core, and is then transported to the surface, first by radiation and then by convection, where it comes up to the, the photosphere. And from there, it then just radiates away and gives us the you know, the luminosity of the sun that we see today. And then finally, we've just been looking at this idea of there's a very extended hot atmosphere that seems to be shaped by the what looks like the magnetic field on the sun. And basically the whole thing we think is heated up by uh, the magnetic activity of the sun that we're gonna look at in the next lecture. It's still a bit of a mystery as to exactly how that works. So even for the sun, there are plenty of things that uh, modern astrophysics doesn't really understand yet. It's a very complex and difficult thing to, to try and understand as to how that gas gets as hot as it does um, through the action of magnetic fields. But uh, yeah, that, that's the theory, just getting it to work in practice is quite tricky. Okay, um, I'll, let the, uh, I'll leave you with um, another uh, exercise. So <clears throat> a few slides back, we had that picture of the Doppler shifts due to the granulation that showed you how fast uh, the gas was moving up and down uh, due to the convection motion. So I'd like you to just make an estimate. Don't get hung up on the precise value here when it says estimate. There's no real right or wrong answer here, just a, a range of answers that are sensible. So have a look back at that diagram that showed you the range of speeds uh, of, of the gas moving up and down due to the convection. And we think that these kind of rising bubbles move about a distance of about 300 kilometers or so um, before they kind of disperse and, and, and melt into the background again. Um, so how long, work out how long it would take uh, for gas to move at the speeds indicated by those Doppler shifts uh, to travel a distance of 300 kilometers. So a fairly straightforward exercise, but it will give you some feel for you know, the kind of timescales of the dynamics of the outer layers of the sun. And um, something to, a very nice uh, video to watch uh, is a, a sort of a real-time solar eclipse from, uh, from a year ago, uh, filmed from the, uh, one of the European Southern Observatory sites at uh, La Silla in Chile. Uh, so one of the sites that myself and several other members of the Astro Group uh, have been to many times to undertake our observations. Uh, it's a very nice site down there in Chile. Um, and so on the, uh, if you go to the learning resources and then the web resources section of the module on Minerva, um, the first of the web resources is a, is a link to uh, a video showing uh, this real-time solar eclipse. So be patient, you have to watch for um, change in contrast of the camera person as they, um, as they should, eventually you will see the, the coronal emission uh, that we've just been talking about. And good idea, of course, to, to get in the habit of uh, looking at the directed reading uh, for one or other of the textbooks. Um, so the, there's a guide to reading uh, particular chapters uh, on Minerva as well, that's there for you now. Um, so please use that guide because you will very quickly find that certainly the Carol and Osterley book has much more detail than you, you'd ever need for this course. It's, there's a lot of, sort of second, even third year level material uh, in there. 
which you don't need for this course. So don't get bogged down in trying to read the whole textbooks or whole chapters. You know, stick to the sections and individual pages that I that I guide you to, and that will uh, hopefully keep you at the right sort of level. Okay. So that's the end of our first lecture. Uh, next lecture, we will continue the theme of the sun, but this time looking at this whole idea of magnetic activity powering um, not just the corona, but you know, as we shall see, it's highly linked to the sunspot activity. Uh, see you then.